Okay, so um, yes. So this is a talk about web spiders. What is a spider? It looks like this. Technology. This is a spider. Is anyone scared of spiders? Okay, this is a wrong talk for you. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> That's the only picture I have of spiders. I think it's actually a sculpture, and it should be in Amsterdam. But Google lies. Uh, actually, if you Google even for spiders, it returns some really strange pictures. Um, so what is a spider? So web spider is a simple script which goes to a website, uh, pulls some data out, processes that, and gives you a sort of semantical result. So as opposed to looking at the web, at the, at the web as this unstructured mashup of web scalable Node.js JavaScript applications, you look at this in a semantical way, where it's just like, this is my application, I need to pull something out, say from Amazon, from eBay, from bbc.co.uk, and you look at that in a semantical way. So you can use it for all sorts of cool things. And that's what they do. Uh, so what, like, people call me Joe. I have this very strange name right here. Not a lot of people can pronounce that. I, I used to say, like, if anyone can pronounce this name, I'll buy you beer. I've never bought beer anyone. Uh, actually, I've bought beer to a lot of people, but for different reasons, I guess. Um, so I, 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 I do a lot of different things, and I travel, and I speak at a lot of different conferences. I was here last year, no, a year before that. And um, we also do, we also create web spiders. Uh, I have a slide, at, I think one of my last topics I talk about is the legal issues of writing spiders. And that's why I don't have the company I work for in the slides, so we don't get sued. Um, so why, why would you do this? Why would you do this? Why would you go and, and then scrape websites? There's a lot of different reasons, but the main one is that we need data. Why it's not working? So we need data. Why do we need data? Data is, data is very good. You can make a lot of decisions if you have data. If you don't have data, you can make decisions. Also, data means you can make money. You get data, you do some clever things with it, and profit. Uh, I think Amon has a similar thing. You just do something and there's profit. So why, why do we have to scrape the data? Why it doesn't exist? Because people don't have APIs. So first of all, most of the APIs, APIs people have are horrible. Um, or they have throttling, which limits how much data you can extract of them. So you need a web spider. Second of all, I guess what a lot of people don't realize is that if people are actually scraping your website, they probably need an API. Uh, if you don't have an API, you, do, you just don't leave a choice to a lot of people. Um, so what people end up doing is that they, they look at the website and say, oh, this actually has a lot of cool stuff which I could use. Let's scrape it. Um, there's, a, there's another field which, a lot, like a lot of the things I do, I can, can be described as this. It's called data science. What data science revolves around is that you ask a question saying, I'll be interested to know what are the most popular I know, music bands mentioned on the BBC. And that's the sort of question you want to ask for various different reasons. But you don't have this data. You can't just ask the BBC what they have in their website. So you go around and you find that data, you find that, you extract the data, you treat it well, and then you can use it for all the different things. So when you're doing data science, when you're trying to answer sort of different questions, you need to find that data. And that tends to be the best place is on a web. That's what we do mainly. So how does it work? Um, very, very simple. So first of all, you figure out what you want to request. And that's a very subjective question because it, it, it depends on, on what you're looking for. Like if you're trying to build Google.com clone, obviously that means you want to request every single page on the web and, and process them. But in most cases, you don't really need that. You, you need very, very, very small subset of data. So once you figure it out, you request those pages, you build them, uh, you request them from the web, you store them somehow. Then you process that for a parser. So rather than having an HTML page, if, it, if you're requesting actual HTML pages, maybe you're requesting images and doing analysis on them. But if you request an HTML page, you run through a certain algorithm to extract data. So for example, rather than having a BBC HTML markup, you extract a, a title of a, of a new news article and an abstract of that. Or if you're, tr if you're trying to get product information or sports information, you're extracting actual numbers and you have really concise data. And then once you have it, you can store it. So in four steps, we went from not having the data, we figured out what we need, we requested that, we actually extracted that from a source which is unstructured, and as most HTML pages are, it's really random and broken. You extracted that, and you have it, and you can use it for all the different things. So, obviously, the, the biggest problem people have is like how do you, like how do you actually figure out what to extract? Um, if you have a if you have a need for a certain bit of information, for example, a lot of things we do, 
require us to get as much as we can information about products people are selling on, on various different e-commerce stores. So there is loads of them online, and if in a theoretical pos like possibility, it would be nice for us to have every single product, every, every single e-commerce store sells in our database. The problem though, how do you actually do that? Do you build a scraper to go around and through every single page on the web, extract information and look for products, look for pages which look like products, store that, and go with that? Or do you actually look for specific things? And my, my, my best advice, and when you're building things like that, try to be as, as, as focused as possible. So if you're building web spiders to extract information, build them specifically for a certain website or for, say, the category of websites. Because if you want to build those generic web spiders, like Google does, because Google, Google doesn't go around the web and builds a, a web spider for every single different website. They just don't have resources and it's very expensive to do that. So what we do is we build a very generic one, we use machine learning to figure out what a product is or what a sports team is and then extract the information. The problem though, it's very hard to do that. You need a lot of resources. So the way to get to that point is actually you start by ver doing very small things, usually like doing a specific website, doing a specific list of URLs and you start from that and, and everything works out. So, so how do you actually make a request? And that's, that's, this whole subject is something I spent probably three months working, is how to actually, how to use PHP efficiently to make requests. Because in, in, most, in most simple terms, you can just do this. Um, you just, anyone doing this? Why? Like why? So, <laughs> so first of all, this is, a, this is a function to read files. This is not a function to read HTTP, HTTP resources. If you do that, um, if everything is fine, you, you, you will actually not notice anything else. You actually get an HTML back, everything is fine. The problem though, what happens if there is an HTTP error thrown? What happens if there is a network latency issue and then something is not functioning right? This whole thing explodes. It's just, it's not the way to do that. So when HTTP errors happen, that's actually one of the key things you want to do is actually, so if you're requesting a lot of requests, your, your spider is getting the data, eventually, you're probably going to get 404s. Eventually, you're going to get 503s, which means the website is saying, fuck off, you're requesting too many things. Uh, and they do actually a lot of that. Especially the biggest websites will eventually start throwing HTTP code saying, you're requesting too many things, can you actually dial it down a bit? And you should probably. Uh, I'll tell a story why I didn't, and oh, it's, a, it's a funny story. Um, so what you're trying to do is optimize things. So, um, Assuming you're running things on Linux, and probably you are, unless you're running them on Windows, but then it's just, why? Uh, if you're running PHP on Windows, it, the, the PHP doesn't actually do web requesting itself. It doesn't request remote URLs, your, uh, remote IPs itself. It delegates that to curl extension, usually, and then delegates that to the Linux kernel. Most of the requests, most of the requests you're gonna make are gonna be TCP IP requests. Very simple, everything works. The problem though, TCP, TCP IP request works like that. You open a connection to a certain IP address and then you can call, you can send requests, everything is fine. But then you close an extension or close a socket, uh, curl does it for you, you close a socket. The funny thing is that socket is not actually closed for at least two minutes by default on Linux. Why? Because if you close a socket, and socket usually runs on a specific IP on a specific port. If you close that socket and the kernel level doesn't, like the information is gone, if a dropped packet arrives a second later, all of a sudden Linux kernel has no idea where it should go because the socket doesn't exist anymore. So by default, it leaves the sockets open for at least two minutes. So if packets dropped or re relayed by proxies are coming in late, Linux kernel can understand and maybe discard them. But basically it tries to prohibit their you open a socket, you close it, and open another one in the same port, and then some lost packet from a different connection comes in and everything just explodes. Um, that creates a problem because like Linux, again, by default, you can only do roughly 25,000 open connections, which sounds like a lot. It actually is not because if, if connection stays open for two minutes, you can only do so many requests a second. Um, so what, so I was, I was reading and I was trying to understand why does PHP doesn't have a good way for me to open a connection to an IP address and be able just to call the 
call the different URLs and keep getting the results. Because even, even if you keep calling, say, on a bbc.co.uk, same domain, same IP address, you, you will be creating a new connection every single time, new socket every single time. If you start doing, I don't know, 100 requests a second, chances are, very, very quickly, everything is gonna break. The problem, though, it's very hard to figure out why. I, I spent ages, like, Googling for how to, how to optimize Linux kernel, how to reduce that two minutes to 10 seconds or one second, how to increase the open connection limit. I think the biggest one I got was 50,000. You keep doing this, and what I realized is, I was like, wait a second, connection sh should be able to re be re reusable because curl actually allows you to reuse connections. The problem, though, it's extremely difficult, I guess, to figure out how to do that. So I have an example of how to do that. So in most cases, you would start, uh, you would start something like this, which is very, very simple. That's a, that's a PHP code. You open a curl handle. You set the URL. It's just a, it's just set a few options depending on what you're doing. You set that. You request things. Boom, gone. Every time you call this, Linux, uh, yes, Linux opens a new socket. That's terrible performance because you're creating sockets, eventually you're gonna either run out of memory or everything is gonna, gonna start to block. If actually, if you, close, if you call this in a closed loop for a million times, it will actually slow down very, very quickly and everything's just gonna freeze for a while until the sockets reopen again. And that's a big problem because you're not using uh, uh, resource efficiently. How do you do that right? This way. Um, code looks almost exactly the same. The difference though, I extracted the request to this method called curl exec with multi. And uh, this is the, the, the shortest version I could fit it in a slide. But basically how it works, it, there's an extension called curl multi extension. Um, same as curl, it just allows you to request multiple things at the same time basically. That's what I thought, and that's what a lot of people think it does. Actually that's not right. What it does, it also keeps the sockets open. So as long as I have my handle at the top um, of a curl multi set, if I keep calling on it, if I keep setting the, the handle, requesting things, and then closing my handle, as long as I keep doing this, I can actually reuse the sockets I have open. And then as soon as I did these things, these things, all of a sudden everything just became so much more faster because I don't need to open new connections. That's actually one of, the, one of the more important things when doing web scraping with PHP or web spiders with PHP. If you don't do this, the performance is going to be horrible. And it, it has to be horrible. But even if, even if you do this, in most cases, you're going to be doing sequential type calls where you have a, a list of ar a, an array of URLs you want to request the data from. You go for that. You extract the data. You do something. And everything seems to be fine. That's, a, that's not a good way to do that. What you want to be doing is use queues for everything. Um, why? Most of the stuff in, in web scraping um, is waiting for I.O. So you request a, domain, uh, a URL and the request is coming in. And while it's doing that, you're waiting for something. If you're requesting slow URLs or remote URLs, which are very far away, uh, you're spending a lot of time waiting for a request to come back again and back again. Especially if you're using SSL, everything is even more slow. So what you want to optimize for is not wait for I.O. ever. If there is an I.O. process happening, it can keep running by itself and you're just doing more things. How does it work? You want to do asynchronous processing with Node.js, for example. I'm kidding. You can do it in PHP too. So what you want to do, in most cases, is use Gearman. When you have a thousand URLs to process, you push them all to the queue and you have, say, I don't know, 10, 100 processes running 100 workers running, which take a URL from a queue, request that, and then process that, for example. So all of a sudden, you can, do, you can be doing 100 parallel requests, which reduce the I.O. weight in combined fashion by a lot. By a lot. But even then, if you, if you actually request a resource, um, wait for it to download in the worker, when you got it, and then when you run the processing in it again, you're still blocking things. So eventually, what you're going to end up with is you have queues for every single stage of a processing. So you have queues for a URL list you need to still process. Then you have a list of HTML documents you want to process to run through the actual parser. And then you have a, a list of processed results you want to store in a data store. And when you push everything to queues, there's not a single I.O. wait. Everything is actually being executed in parallel and everything scales really well. So it, 
that's what you're doing. You do, you do not block for IOs because that's pretty much, it's just, it ruins everything. Um, but even if you don't, the problem with, the problem with the, I guess, web scraping is that internet is not really reliable. Like networking is meant to be not reliable because HTTP is a very recoverable pattern. Whatever you do, you, if the request fails, you can request it again. And that's why queues help, because you have a thousand, thousand URLs you want to process. If any of them fail, you just take the same URL, put it back to the queue, and you just retries. You don't need to control anything. You don't need to do while requests actually exist, keep requesting, keep trying it again. If anything fails, you just put it back to the queue, uh, or mark it in a queue that it wasn't actually finished, try it again. And you keep doing that, and it works out eventually. Um, so we, 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 we figured out how to actually request things, how to go and how to go to the internet and actually get the resources and, and, and then download them efficiently. How do you actually process them? That's actually one of the biggest challenges is that when you have unstructured, in, unstructured pages or HTML, how do you pick certain bits of, bits of pieces of information? There's different ways. Mainly people go with regular expressions. That's a default choice. It's actually a horrible choice. Um, why? Reg regular expressions are, are, not, are just not made for HTML. HTML, you can argue that, but HTML is not actually a regular language. And uh, pushing regular expressions on top of it tends to break. Why? Because you, with regular ex expressions, you either will end up looking at a very very small elements where we'd be saying like, find me an A tag with, and then just extract the, the refs it's linking to. Or you're gonna be looking at very wide things, but then with white space included, your regular expressions are gonna break eventually. And that's, don't even try to go that path. People, people, people try and everyone kind of, oh, just use regular expressions because we can extract anything from anywhere. And if HTML not being valid, that seems to be a, a kind of a nice choice. No, it's actually a very horrible choice. The best, the best thing to do is to use XPath. Uh, one of the best things to do is to use XPath. Anyone have used XPath before? Yes, good, a lot of people. Uh, probably you're, you're asking, XPath is, well, it doesn't, it should not be working on not valid documents um, because most of the pages in the, in, on, the, on the internet not valid HTML. So how do you throw XPath at it? What actually, in practice, it's not really a problem. Uh, mo even the PHP XML libraries will gladly accept any HTML you throw at them and parse that because X like XML is nice for that. Yay for XML. You can actually parse broken documents or if you, if you want to go that path, you can use the tidy extension to actually clean them and get the XML result. Block. Once you have that, you can use XPath to extract certain constructs of, of, of the actual tree and then use them to, for the data. That's the best thing. That's what I use for most of the things because it works, it's stable. And uh, it's way more easier, to, I guess, to debug, especially to debug as compared to regular expressions. There's a new thing, though, which I actually quite like. Um, any, of, any of you have used Selenium before? A few people? So, um, Looking at the Node.js camp, um, what Node.js does, obviously it, it runs JavaScript on the server. It runs V8 on the server. V8 is Chrome, almost. So what people did, PhantomJS is a, is, a, is a browser which runs server side. So it, it behaves exactly like Chrome would do just have no screen, it just, there's no screen. You can, pr you can control it using code, uh, similar fashion how you use Selenium for, but it runs without actually any screen, so it doesn't, it doesn't need to load the UI elements. What's good about it, because it's, it's an actual Chrome browser living in, in the memory, it actually loads things and parses things like a browser would do, and browsers are amazing at parsing this unstructured, broken HTML code. So using PhantomJS, you can actually use that to request things, to, and then it, it parses things, and if, if you need it loads like, things from using JavaScript, using AJAX, 
Ajax, it does images and all this stuff. It, it does everything normally, but doesn't have this massive overhead of using Selenium for Firefox because it's just too slow for, for web scraping. So I've been playing with using Phantom for web scraping with PHP, and it's actually pretty nice. So how do you do that is you have a normal PHP script, but rather than using Selenium with a default Firefox extension, you point Selenium to a Phantom running in a server, and then it does everything exactly the same. But then you can use um, jQuery expressions. If you, if, if you just load a jQuery, you can use jQuery expressions to load specific nodes. So what, what you're used to, just using CSS classes and ID names and ID tags and class tags, you can use the same thing for extracting the content, which is still not as easy to do with XPath. By just using CSS extensions, it's way more easier. A similar thing, uh, Symfony, Symfony 2 has a similar thing. Um, they have a browser built in PHP almost, so it can load HTML and do these sort of manipulations using CSC, CSS paths on just PHP level. I wouldn't recommend you do that because it's just horribly slow. Phantom JS, it tends to be the best for me. Um, the problem though, you might be thinking, it's okay, so you requested something and you, you have this fancy code and you're, you're parsing things and everything seems to be working. How do, you, how do you actually handle when things break? Because people change websites. And that's the bigger the website is, they, they like to change things, change things once in a month just to break every single web scraper which is scraping them. Especially all the e-commerce sites tend to move things around just to break your code. Especially regular expressions break if you move things around. So how do you, how do you handle page changes? Um, the way you handle that is you, you, you monitor things. And I have a whole s a section about how you monitor things. But basically what happens is you just assume your script is not broken until someone tells you it is. And that better be not a person, but you're gonna have some monitoring code where all of a sudden you're not getting data imported to your, to your database and you notice that your script is broken. Adding checks to see like if this matches a certain pattern, not the a, not a best way. The easiest way to do, I expect my code to, to run and return results if all of a sudden HTTP errors start appearing or parsing errors start appearing where all of a sudden I'm not extracting data anymore, you can either kill the scraper or notify me by email or in any other fashion and I'll be able to come in and actually fix that. Uh, but the, the important thing is you have to act like a human. So web scraping or web spiders, is, it's, I don't think it's actually well defined yet. Is it actually legal or not? Um, so what you're trying to make sure is that well, what you're trying to make sure you don't get blocked is that you act like a human. So from a server logs, there shouldn't be any difference of you requesting that page from your scripts to an actual normal person browsing that page. Because as long as you do that, you're first of all not causing any harm, you're not upsetting the stats of the server, um, and second of all, it's harder, I guess, for people to block. And that's obviously what you want to achieve because it, it sucks when you write a very nice web scraper, you're extracting all this cool data, and then they block you. Um, so you want to act like a, like a human. How do you do that? Obviously, first of, the first step is your browser. Um, you want to act like a browser. So all the headers you send should look exactly like a normal browser would send. Because then from a server logs, it's indistinguishable if it actually is a browser requesting a page or a, or a script requesting a page. There's absolutely no difference, except for my IP address being replicated at all the same time. So what's the, what's the right way to do that? Well, basically what you, what you do is you, is, you, is you go to a server or, or you go to your browser and just copy and paste every single HTTP header it sends and put them in an array and just pass that through curl. Um, this is a white hack, white hat, black hat thing. What you should be doing, I guess, in theory, is you should be saying your user agent is actually your spider name. But then, obviously, people know it's you. Uh, and if you're requesting a big, uh, big web page, or any big web page, it's gonna get blocked in, in very, very quickly. There's just no way. If you, if, you tell, if you tell that, that you're requesting things from your script, they're gonna get blocked. So if you wanna make sure you don't get blocked, and that's up to you for decide if it's, if it's fine or not, so you pass headers like this. Because then, you look at the access logs on the server, and you can't tell if it's happening or not. Another thing to do is if a server has cookies or sessions, you probably want to use them. Um, 
obviously, if they, they take much more space because you need to pass around the cookies, but if, if, a, serv if a site expects you have cookies, um, all the browsers will pass them. And if you don't do this, things look weird. I had this case where one of the websites would, would every time you request that, would return your session ID as a cookie, or PHP does the same thing, and you would just, obviously a browser would just take that, pass it on a second request, so the server knows what's the session ID you're looking for. We were ignoring cookies altogether, so we're not passing any of them. Pretty much the server ran out of space to allocate, allocate session IDs because we were just requesting so many of them and not ever using them again. So it still had them in the database and kept re requesting them again and again and again. Uh, that's one of the DDoS things you can do. So what you wanna do is use cookies. And actually once you use cookies, you can actually replicate the login action. A lot of people get put off by the fact that, oh, I need to actually log into this website to extract that information. If you go to any of the freelancing websites, and I go over to kind of for research purposes to see what people are struggling with. Most of the free freelancing websites would ask be like, add, create me the script to log into this website and get some information. Because a lot, a lot, in most times, the information is stored in, uh, in, uh, under a certain login. So it's either a backend system you want to access. And using, using backend systems is not that hard. The only thing you need to change in curl, you just pass a cookie jar and a cookie file. Um, and then it stores every single cookie server sends to that file, and every time you request it again, it takes all those cookies and passes again. So again, it looks exactly like a browser, but you can support you can support sessions and you can log into things, and 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 and, and a server knows what you're doing. Uh, although the most important thing is, how do you actually avoid getting blocked? That's that's the most interesting topic. Because how do you like how do you avoid getting blocked? and also not get sued by everyone in the, in, the, in, the, in the state. So avoiding getting blocked. It's not, it's actually very easy. So I'm sorry if, if your sites are being scraped, but there's no way you can actually block anything. No, unless you have insane amount of I don't know, technology advancements. But what happens though, is that it's very hard to tell if it's actually a bot scraping your site or a normal person using your site. If you have a very big website, there is like loads of traffic all the time from very weird sources, especially now with Anonymous doing their own scraping and killing and DDoSing sites. It's very hard to tell. The, the good way to avoid getting blocked is to not DDoS people. Um, <laughs> because if you DDoS people, they will know it's you. And that's probably one of the, one of the best stories we, we, I had is when we actually did DDoS one of the, one of the bigger websites because we just didn't realize that we ignored everything I said, so we weren't using cookies. Every time an HTTP code would not be 200, we would just request it again. So our server was saying, please calm down. I just, I can't give you more stuff. And you're like, no, please, please give us more. Then you have 3,000 servers requesting things as quickly as possible from the same data center. The website is running anyway. You deal with those things very, very quickly. Uh, so you, like, if you, even if you're scraping, be nice to people. Do not DDoS them because <laughs> it's just, and I, and I had DDoS people before and it's not nice because you feel like, like a horrible person. And I, I'm balancing, I'm like, every day I'm like, I'm a nice pe person or not? So these sort of things I think are pushing on an edge. So how do you actually make it nice? Use proxies. Um, so there's a few different reasons why you wanna be using proxies. First of, all, first of them, so your server doesn't get blocked, that's one of them, because no one can tell your IP address. Second of all, proxies are nice because they, they do certain, certain things you just wouldn't have to implement in PHP. So they do caching and co content neg negotiation, they do retries and all these sort of things, you can just delegate that to proxies and have them take care of all this stuff so you don't do that yourself. They also help you not to get blocked, how? Because Imagine rather than requesting everything from the same IP address, you request everything from 200 IP addresses. That's very easy. That's also how DDoSing works. So you're again balancing on the, on the edge. But actually using proxies allows you, again, to, you're requesting a lot of things, but on the server side, they're seeing 200 different people requesting things, so it looks to be fine. Again, if you're not overdoing it, if you're not requesting too many things, everything is gonna work out. Um, 
But obviously, you want to act like a, like a human. So if, um, if you have a website, and I know it has like, I know, for example, a, a list of categories and a list of products or news items or any sort of items in those categories, you want to probably replicate the, the pattern you're requesting of a normal person. So rather than just going to every single product, you probably want to make your request look like, make your request look like we're coming from a normal person. Because a normal person would not be opening every single product in a new tab. Just <laughs> Some people do, I guess. Some people have million tabs, but most people won't. So what we do is we're going to click on a product, go back, do this again, and, and do these sort of things. So one of the, one of the, again, one of the things we've done is to imagine you have an e-commerce page. And you go to a product, you add it to cart. Once you add it to cart, it shows you um, the, the cart item, and then you, do, which, uh, you obviously added one item. So you go and you edit that number, and then it says, I don't have this much. This is the only amount I have. So if you had one, you enter 10, and it says, oh, I only have five. Wait a second. I can use this to figure out how many products you have in stock. So what you do is you go and you enter 999, and it just says, oh, I only have 500. Okay, I know you have 500 now. And then you delete that item from a cart, and you repeat that for million other products we have. But, and again, you're kind of, again, it, you're kind of replicating the normal user behavior uh, because you add things to the cart, you update things, you delete it from an item, item from a cart, and then you do it again. Obviously, you do it for a lot of different products and in a very short amount of time from a lot of different IPs, but you're, you're, you're still replicating the, the pattern. Like, I'm going to get arrested probably just before I actually leave this place. <laughs> So one of the things we do is actually use it. I'm not sure why it's not a default option on curl. Um, so this is called auto-refer. So what it happens is if you, if you request one thing and you request another thing, it passes the first, the first request URL. So obviously, that's what happens in a browser because you click on something and it says it's coming from this page. So the, the click is coming from this page. And if you do this, the server can tell where the, the request is coming. Most of the pages, most of, most of the things I've seen, if you, if you try to, for example, log in to a website and you're not passing a refer, but basically I'm say, you're saying I'm, I'm coming from nowhere, the server just says, how can you be logging in without actually visiting the login form first? Because all of a sudden you're just sending the post request. So obviously they check that. And if you do that right, nothing checks. Um, another thing not to get blocked, and that's a very up to you to decide, it's robots.txt. So my understanding of robots.txt, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was created for search engines to be able to tell the sort of areas you don't want to, the search index to be created off. So if you have private pages or you have pages which I don't know, change too often or just are old pages, you don't, don't, wanna, don't want them to appear on a Google search, you just say to the robots.txt saying, disallow this URL, don't do it. Um, that's why I kind of argue that maybe you should not be treating robots.txt. Again, depends on how the color of your hat. You either read robots.txt file, request things, uh, only which are you allowed to. But in most cases, if, a, if a, it's a bigger site, they just won't allow you to request things, allow you. Um, some of the web scrapers, you can actually go and kind of pay money to, to be able to use them, usually use this sort of thing. So because they're big enough, but for all, most of the small things, I just ignore this because I can, I guess. Um, so we come to the, the, the nutshell is legal issues. Um, so I've done my research, and the research concludes that there's not, there's not actually any defined laws or defined uh, practices in a court defining is it legal or not to scrape websites. How I argue this? If you have a data publicly available where a normal person can, can look at it and, and see it, why can't I extract that? What's prohibiting me? The only thing you can't do, though, is you can't go to bbc.co.uk and extract their news articles and publish them as yours because they're copyrighted material itself. Like the, the whole text is a copyrighted material. So it doesn't matter if it's a, it's a normal person looking at it or you're scraping it yourself. Using it for anything else than reading, obviously, it's illegal because it's, it's someone wrote it. But when it comes to I don't know, titles, when it comes to numbers, you can't patent a number. 
If you could, 7 is mine. Because iOS 7 is being released right now. Big time money. But you can't pay the numbers well. So I, I lost on this. Um, oh, oh, uh, maybe, maybe someone paid it at five, 6, so PHP 6 is not yet, because it's, we can't use 6 anymore. <laughs> so legal issues are weird. The problem, though, you're going to get sued very, very quickly. Um, why? Well, so first of all, it, 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 depends, it depends on how clever people are, the people who are requesting it. In, in most cases, um, it, it should not matter that someone is scraping you. Um, you. You should ignore that. The only thing is, if you're actually DDoSing people, that's what actually what happens in most cases. Most people don't care that you're scraping them and you're extracting that information, but they care that you're actually DDoSing their site. So you're actually doing a criminal damage to their business because you're making a certain part of that unavailable. So probably if you do that, you're going to get sued unless you use proxies. <laughs> because then they can't track you. So I mean, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide the legality of this. I guess it very much depends, everything about scraping very much depends on what do you use it for? Do you use it for good? Do you use it for commercial or non-commercial reasons? And how do you do that? If you actually do things nicely, especially if you follow HTTP codes and it, like you request properly and you're not abusing the fact that you can just smash your request to the server, people won't care. Even big sites don't care because it's impossible to block. If you look at how you're doing requests, there's no absolutely no difference from your, your script and a, and a browser. So the only thing a server can do is block an IP address. But then, because IP addresses are dynamic, they're obviously not gonna do it forever because that IP address needs to be reused. The problem though is, for example, Amazon EC2 has a, a signed list of IP addresses. You can't access Google Dot com or any of the Google sites from Amazon EC2 instances. So if you just create an instance and just do a normal vget, you're not gonna get anything. Because everyone uses Amazon to scrape things. Uh, it's the same thing on the Hacker News. For example, if you use Amazon to scrape hackernews.com or news.ycombinator.com, it actually limits the speed to 10 kilobytes a second. That's actually one of the best things to do, is actually rather than block things from a server side, just limit things or make things confusing. The best idea I have if anyone wants to do it, let's do it. If someone starts scraping you, add an if statement to your code, which changes the website, depending is it scraping or not, especially when it comes to prices or numbers, and be like, Haha, just suck on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually very, very effective. Why it's effective? Because the way people do scrapers are, are stupid. And how do you do that? What you want to do is you need to measure everything. And that's something we've done a lot of research on, and how do you do it right? But basically what you're looking for is make sure that you, whatever scraping you're doing, whatever contact extraction you're doing, you measure the performance of that. Currently, uh, we do 100 million pages per server per day, which equals to, I think, more than 1,000 requests a second. When you're, re when you're at that scale, um, how do you know if things are wrong? How do you know if a proxy IP address is not functioning right? How do you know that the request processing time is as efficient as possible? The way you know it, you measure things. I've given, uh, I've given the talk at, at different conferences, uh, so it's pretty interesting if you can check out the slides, it, it talks about that, but there's a very good extension called STATS-D, which basically allow you to measure things. And the things you're, you're looking to measure is these sorts of things, response times. Just what any, any request you're making out of a scraper, just measure the time it takes for a request to come back and just log all these results. Whatever request you're making, just log them. Then take them and graph them and, and be able to plot the request times. Because then, if you're playing with the curl extensions, if you're playing with Linux settings, and you'll, like, depending on your size, you'll, you'll start playing with these things, you're trying to optimize the I.O. wait time. When you start doing that, you realize that, oh, actually, I changed something and my graph just dropped. That, that gives you insight. Or if, if you upgrade something and you change something and you get some, like have developers messing around with things and things are increasing, again, you graph them. Because when, you, when you're making a lot of requests on something like internet, which is the speed is never a constant, it's very hard to tell if actually things are running fine. Especially, anything, like testing anything locally is meaningless. 
because probably the scale is going to be very small and your network speed is not going to be as fast probably as the server speed you're going to get. And, and especially we are looking for, something I like especially is, whatever HTTP error you get, just graph it, like be able to tell when errors happen. Because when, then you can tell, wait a second, all of a sudden someone actually blocked me. All of a sudden I, I'm getting 503 errors on my graph. Someone actually blocked me. I know, I don't need to check anything in my logs. If that error happens once a day for a minute, it's just a random thing, so it just malfunctions. You don't actually need to care. If, because if you look at a log with errors, it's hard to tell if it actually happens all the time or sometime. When you graph things, it, it's very clear. But most importantly, if you have a process where you take an HTML page and you extract information out of it, and you come up with some kind of semantical entity, let's say it's a product with a title, price, and category, just have semantic knowledge. Just say, if a price is less or equal to zero, or more than, I don't know, a million, probably your scraper has broken. Because in most, well, unless you're scraping Pagani website. In most cases, if you're scraping, I don't know, some kind of e-commerce shop, no one is gonna cost a million. But if your code starts in, interpreting things as a million, maybe the website moved a, a comma on the number and your code is not interpreting things right. These are sort of things. And then any time very, 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 the parse response doesn't match what you were looking for in a, in a very abstract way, the expectations don't match, maybe you have a title size, any sort of things you can tell by just looking at the website. Every time like this happens, you log that and you graph that. And again, all of a sudden, Everything changes on the website. Regular expressions break, XPath break, whatever you're doing, everything breaks, the graphs will tell you if it's working fine. Pretty much that's the only way to tell this sort of large scale request based things if they're actually working fine. And that's what you do. And by now, there's a, there's, a, there's a page I can log in right now, which I won't, but I could, I guess. And I show you every single graph of any, every single measure. And I can log in this today, create an alert saying, if there is more than 100 HTTP errors uh, in a minute, send me an email. And I don't need to check that. If something breaks, it's an email, and I know, and it's fine. So it's recoverable. So how do you do that? Is you look at metrics, and you're able to tell the performance, the error rates, the success rates, all these sort of things, and you take them and measure them. In, in PHP terms, that usually means re reducing the IO weight. So use the queues as opposed to sequentially requesting things. Requesting thing, Processing that story in a database, split that to queues. So every time you do need to do something, there's a queue waiting for that. You don't need to actually block to do something. If you, want to, if you need to process things, you can process them as quickly without waiting for the download to happen. If you need to download things as quickly, you don't need to have the processing to finish before you can download the next item on all these sort of things. Obviously, you need to have, a manage, you need to have metrics for the queues length because if you're requesting things quicker when you can process them, then it's, it's pointless what you're doing. But eventually you're gonna optimize that. So web, web, web crawling for fun and profit. Um, in short, it's, it's unclear if it's legal or not. Um, I guess it depends on your, on your use cases. If you're stealing copyrighted information, it's definitely illegal. Uh, but if you're using it, if you're using the public information for something else, especially internally, no one really cares because it's public anyway. It's, someone put it on a website, it's fine. Don't use what they said in a court. Like, <laughs> I don't have authority on this. I, I, if, I, if I had my chance, like if my understanding about web, it should be open. It should, like everything about web, it should be open web. So whatever you put online, it should be, like anyone should use it for anything they want. I, I don't care. So when it comes to PHP, m measure things. Whatever you're building, me make sure you measure things and make, make sure you don't block on things. That's the most important thing when building web scrapers, don't block on things. When parsing comes, there's different, different ways you can do. But basically the, thing, the, the simplest thing, download the page, create an XML object out of it, run an XPath query on it, get a result back, store it. It's very, very simple. So with that, thank you. And hopefully I'll see you next year. And I'm not in jail. <laughs>